Hi, welcome to the Social Mobility uh, Commission's employer event, Mentoring as a Tool to Support Social Mobility. We've got a great session ahead of us today. Um, I'm Paula Kemp, I'm Head of Employee Engagement here at the Commission. Um, and today we're joined by Eddie Fletcher from the Ministry of Justice, who is going to give us an overview of his catapult um, scheme um, that they have launched and is very successfully running throughout um, the uh, uh, the whole of the civil service. Um, and then Eddie and I will join a conversation with Mercy Abel and Rachel Dolby, so uh, both of which have been mentor and a mentee on uh, different programmes. And they'll give you their perspective um, from that. And hopefully we'll draw out some really great insight for you in terms of if you're looking to start a scheme yourself or if you're already running a scheme and you want to uh, make it more robust. Um, or indeed, if you're thinking of joining the scheme um, and, and volunteering to be either a mentor or a mentee. Um, and then we'll also open up the floor for questions from you. And at the end, I'll share some more resources um, and support where you can find, find some more information. Uh, just a little bit of uh, workshop etiquette. Um, if you could remain on mute, that would be great. We've disabled the chat function, uh, but if, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A function um, and we will get your questions at the end of the session. Our session. Um, as you know, uh, because it said earlier on, the webinar will be recorded and there are closed captions available uh, for anybody who um, wants to access those. Um, so we start really with Eddie Fletcher. Um, so Eddie is the head of social mobility, the Ministry of Justice and People Group. Um, he was part of the team responsible for setting up the now award-winning Catapult Internal Mentor Initi Initiative at the Ministry of Justice. And then it led to the delivery of the full-scale cross-government Catapult programme. Um, this has grown and in its current form, and Eddie will tell us a bit more about that, um, there are 1,712 participants. So Eddie knows a thing off to you, a, a, a thing off you, a thing or two about um, what it means to have a, such a large scale program, but obviously also the pitfalls and, um, and the opportunities that brings. Um, the program is aimed at supporting staff from lower socioeconomic backgrounds to achieve their fuller potential. And it's designed to inspire and support colleagues who self-identify as coming from a lower socioeconomic background. And it helps the civil service better reflect the community it serves at all levels. Um, so Eddie, over to you. Thank you, Paula, and uh, thank you for everyone joining uh, this session today. Um, hopefully you'll glean some information from uh, what I'll talk about and uh, uh, hopefully you'll be able to take some of it back into your organisations and, 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 and get some benefit from this. Um, so why did we bother to set up a mentoring programme for staff from less privileged backgrounds? Well, essentially, it's based on data that we received for uh, following a, a piece of work that was done by the Social Mobility Commission on the civil service as a whole. So just a bit of context, civil service, we've got about 450,000 members of staff across many, many different departments. And basically we, we enact what government does. So we're responsible for policy in housing, in education, health, et cetera, et cetera, justice in our case. So looking at that organization as a whole, what we found was nothing surprising really that we were a bit posh as an organization so basically we did not reflect the the society as a whole um wasn't surprising what was surprising i think to some was that that the fact that the further you go up the organization the the less representative we we become as an organization so the higher up becomes less representative so there's a bit of uh, data there that helps um, show that. But for me, the most important thing is the bit at the top, which is about the commitment that we've got to having that inclusive workforce. So it's not just a, a nice to have to have an organization that represents society. It's a necessity for us. You know, we enact government policy. It is only right that we do that with people from all backgrounds and we're fully representative. We know there's an issue with getting in to our organization. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And there's also an issue around getting on. So the programme that we decided to build 
was based around this. So having that data and that evidence to build something, and that's pretty important. Can you flip the next slide, please? Um, we're in a Chris Whitty as usual. Um, okay, so what did we do? So we've got issues in, in many areas, and I think many organizations have got the same issue. So that attraction piece is one, and we've got programs that look at that. So we do outreach and we, we, we engage with schools, colleges, and universities. What I'm going to talk to you about, and we're going to focus on mentoring a little bit, is a program we've built for staff. So we know that staff are not progressing their career. If you come from a less privileged background, you're less likely to be able to get on. So it's that getting on element. Um, there are a number of barriers around this. But one of them we felt was that the, the unwritten rules of progression, the, 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 the sharing of knowledge from senior leaders down to those in, in, in more junior grades, helping them have that fairness. So whilst we know that uh, those that come from more privileged backgrounds, they've got those connections and they're able to use those networks more effectively, those from less privileged backgrounds were not able to access that. It's also really important to say that whilst background prevent is a, is a, has a massive impact on things like education, progression, et cetera, it's not, an, it's not a denoter of talent and capability. So it's about bringing all those talents through. So keeping talent as a, as a key issue. So what do we do? So within MOJ, we built very quickly a mentoring program. It's pretty simple. So what we did is we took uh, staff, uh, we, we, took a, we took a view about what, what is a senior leader. So in our organization, it's grade seven. So that's, a, that's a, 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 the first senior management grade in effect and you know, would be responsible for managing significant programs and significant numbers of staff. Um, you might manage a court at that level. Um, staff below that grade, they were our mentees. Staff above that grade were our mentors. We said that you must be coming from a lower socioeconomic background. So we asked the four key questions around, you know, at age 14, parental occupation, education, your education and your self-assessment. But our mentors are from any background. And I think that's quite important when I talk about impacts. So essentially, we smash them together um, based on profession. So we use what is your main profession or your profession of interest? And we put them together based on that criteria alone. Um, it's a, a 12 month program. It's a minimum of one hour a month uh, for those 12 months. And it's a mentoring relationship. So we give our mentors a bit of guidance, but essentially we give them the freedom to, to understand what the needs of the mentee are. And we give the mentee a lot of, um, a, a lot of support to, to understand what they need out of it as well. So we let those relationships uh, gather pace, as we say, um, I think it, it's really, it's also qu quite important to say that, you know, a lot of the issues around progression are around confidence and around aspiration. So we really look at those two elements very early on in the program. So we ask our mentees to make initial contact. So when we send the contact details out, it's up to the mentee to drive that initial contact. Again, that puts them in the driving seat to be, um, and then also allows them to build that confidence. So it may be difficult. They may have never spoke to a senior leader before in their lives. They've got to make that initial contact, but it's a contact that's waiting for them to make the contact, if that makes sense. Um, so what we've also done is we've built in additional development sessions. So we've got this, this captive audience to a certain extent where they are keen to progress. They know that they need some development. So we've put additional development sessions in there. So you know that might be simple things like application processes, interview techniques, but it's also around, you know, widening that understanding about what different professions or different um, business areas do. And again, just raising that awareness. So uh, as, as Paula mentioned, uh, we ran this cross government. So we did it internally within the Ministry of Justice, and then we've run it cross government for two years with 18 months in. So we're on our second cohort. We had 1300 matches on the first cohort, which was significant. And pressured uh, it grew on our second cohort again to 1700 and we we anticipate that that will grow again year on year um just un understand it's not a complex process to run the matching process is difficult so once you've got the applications in matching them together takes a little bit of time there are programs that do it for you we do it manually at the moment and i just thought it might be interesting to just put those resources that 
what do we do? To, what how much does it cost us to run that program? And it's about 0.6 of a program manager and about 0.2 of an admin. And that's not continual. So that it comes in fits and starts, hence the 0.6 and the 0.2. Okay, next slide, please. I'll whistle through this. Okay, so some of the impacts then. So what, what is it showing? What is it doing? So as I said, we've got a, a wider social mobility program. It does, it, it covers a lot of different things like outreach, in reach and resourcing. These are some of the impacts that we're showing and I'll, I'll, I'll whistle stop through a few of these. So we've, we've got that individual impact. So how is it affecting the individual? So we know that on our, mentee, on our mentoring program, about 42% are progressing their career in the first 12 months. So progression is not normal, not always uh, a vertical. It might be into a different area of work. So we talk about progression, not just promotion. It's about different areas of work. Um, it's, it's supporting them to build their confidence so we know that they build confidence and they know they'll build aspiration. So we, we're showing that using the mentoring program is having an impact on those individuals. What's it doing about that organizational impact though? Obviously that transfer of promotion or progression will help the organization better reflect it, the, the society at all levels. And that's quite important. So as we show them moving up the levels that should help us better reflect that. But it's also helping the organization understand about what talent is. And that's impacting the cultural element of it. So we talk about the individual being the mentee. It's about the mentor as well. So what's happening with that mentor in terms of what are they learning? So very often we're putting them into a, into a relationship with a, somebody from a completely different background and potentially a completely different culture. So that's starting them to uh, understand a bit more about that culture, a bit more about that background and changing the way that they think about what talent looks like. So, you know, starting to affect that mirror recruitment that we do on, on, a, a, on a natural basis. It's starting to affect that. And we're starting to see that with the comments that are coming through from, from mentors. It's also having a huge impact on the organization as a whole with the way it thinks about inclusion. So it's not just about the old protected characteristics, say old current, it's about that more holistic uh, approach to inclusion. And, you know, we know that when we look at social background, we adversely impact on uh, ethnicity, on gender, on disability. 43% of our mentees have come from an ethnic minority, 60% female, 26% have a disability. So it's you helping the organization to have that inclusion. Quickly onto the last slide, and I'll be very swift on this one. Okay, so uh, set up and pitfalls, essentially build it and they will come, you know, or they won't come. So it, it, what we did is we just thought, this is an idea, we've got this evidence, let's build it and see what happens. And it was not about going gold standard straight away. You know, we could have waited two or three years and made sure it was right and done all the consultancy, but that would have wasted two years and those two, those 3,000 people would not have had a mentor. So we built it with very limited resources and with a, with a very much an ambition of let's see what happens and see if we can make it better. And we use the people involved in it to help us make it better. So very open to challenge and that's really key. Communications, you know, getting the message out, you know, we're an organization of 450,000 and we've got 1700 mentees. So it's, you know, we, there's a way to go yet before we're um, able to support all our staff. Uh, getting the right communication in the right place, that was really difficult for us. Uh, We've done it on it. We've just released a, a graduate mentoring program at similar problems as well. So we're, we're still learning about that. Ensuring support structures in place are really key for us. So making sure that mentors and mentees feel supported. They, they, they've got somewhere they can come to when they've got an issue, if their match is not working out, or they've got questions about things that mentees are asking, how can we help them? So again, using our using our collaboration and our, our stakeholders to help answer those questions is really key. And also, I think the final point is about celebrating the success. Celebrate it and celebrate your failures as well, because when it goes wrong, you can look, sometimes learn a lot more about it. So we're pretty good at failing, but that failure has enabled us to be successful in many areas. Okay, that's enough from me. I'll, we can get onto some good questions, I think. Brilliant, thanks Eddie, um, and that's great actually, and as 
As one of the 1,712 people, uh, thank you to the Ministry of Justice uh, for setting up that uh, session. So I've been part of that session for uh, this year's cohort um, and, and already have seen the benefits for my mentee in terms of seeing a, a real change in, in, in the way she's uh, working and the way we're managing our relationship. And she's also um, been accepted onto a fast track program as well, which is great to hear. So, so that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to open up now and introduce the rest of the panel. Um, and we'll follow up on some of those pitfalls in the Q&A and some of those challenges, but also the advantages it, it brings. So um, I welcome Mercy Abel. She's a mentee from Creative Mentor Network. Um, she was part of one of their programs and podcast host of Generation Z or Z, as people would want to call it, careers, podcasts, audacity of we. Uh, Mercy works with brands, businesses and teams to gather and analyse insights to help make clients' marketing campaigns and storytelling more inclusive and was shortlisted for the IPA iList 2022. Uh, Mercy is passionate about highlighting positive intersectional representation in media through founded platforms like Into a Black Mind or Strong Black Woman, as well as improving knowledge exchange between Gen Z, Z and today's leaders on her career podcast, which we've already mentioned. Um, she was part of this uh, creative mentor network run with Amazon Bright Spark. So welcome, Mercy. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll get into a bit more of all of that in a minute. Um, and then we've also got Rachel Dolby, who's Head of Legal Crop Nutri Nutrients at Anglo-American and a mentor on Mission Include programs. So Rachel's a qualified solicitor specialising in projects and infrastructure. She trained at a leading international law firm and moved into industry in 2009, working with in-house teams on infrastructure and wider legal issues. Since 2020, She's led the Crop Nutrients Legal uh, Support Function at Anglo-American um, and educated at a comprehensive school in an ex-mining industrial town in northwest England. And having personally experienced feeling like an outsider in her profession early in her career, Rachel jumped at the chance of being a mentor on the Mission Include Mentoring Programme. Her invaluable support contributed to her mentee being promoted during that period. And I'm sure we'll explore a bit more about what Mission Include is as we go forward. So welcome both of you. Um, and thanks, Eddie, as well, for joining us. So I think the first question is, um, Eddie, you mentioned a bit about the cultural impact the Catapult Mentoring Programme has had. Uh, with most workplaces having a DNI strategy um, or definitely with an intent to create a more inclusive workplace as one of their aims. How do you think implementing a mentoring program supports building inclusivity? Always a good question from you, Paula. Um, okay, so um, as I alluded to, you know, we built the program initially to support mentees, you know, help them progress their career, build confidence, aspiration. What we're finding is that that cultural and organisational change is taking place through our mentors, um, and getting that understanding and putting people in different from different backgrounds together in a one-to-one -one conversation is is really breaking down those barriers. We made a conscious decision at the very start of the program to say, well, shall we put like with like? So, do we want our mentors to come from a poor background or a less privileged background? Do, do we want them to have a particular ethnicity? Do we want to have gender? And, and make sure we're putting people who are similar together. We made a decision to do different people together and see what happened because I think through that difference, we all learn. And what we're finding is that the organization as a whole, the civil service as a whole is learning that way. And you know, it's it can be quite difficult to challenge that, but that true inclusion and that true inclusivity agenda that we're, we're trying to follow is enabled by that bringing people from different backgrounds together. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and as the follow-up, Mercy, I, I know in the introduction I mentioned you recently completed the mentoring, pro mentoring program with Amazon, that you've taken part in a number of mentoring programs and obviously have a, 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 a huge interest in, in inclusive workplaces and inclusive society through the work that you're doing. How do you think these programs build inclusivity? Yeah, thanks, Paul, and thanks for having me. Um, so I indeed have been on a number of mentoring programs before. Um, I have actually been on four. I'm currently on another one <laughs> since we last spoke. But um, what I think about is that 
with these programs, especially ones for me that I like created mental network was specifically for so and um, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, but with the creative industry aspect. And then the program on, I'm on right now is for black creators and it's with the Elephant Room, which is an agency and Clark's Originals. And when mentoring programs are confident enough to be a little bit more specific as to why they're there and what they're trying to support and what they're trying to help is when it makes a little bit more sense as to just making that conversation more specific and making it a bit of a place where I can, I, I can ask the questions that I may be fearful of just a program where it's a little bit more open and it's like, I just want to help you in your career, but how can you help me? What barriers are you trying to help me reduce so that I can then progress in my career? So with all the programs, I've been quite intentional that I've been on and making sure that it is of actual use to me, that it focuses on my background, that it focuses on my experiences and my lived experiences. Because I think when you get more closer to what your actual lived experience is as a mentee, then you can have a little bit more understanding of what questions you wanna ask your mentor and they will have an understanding of how to answer them because you're both kind of aligned already just by the nature of the cobra. Brilliant. And I'm assuming by asking those questions of your mentor, it highlights to them barriers that they may or may not have seen or experienced. Yes, themselves. seen or experienced or had an understanding of what it looks like because they've been in the industry. Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Rachel, having viewed a mentoring programme from the opposite side of the programme, the Mercy, so looking at it from the mentoring perspective, having taken part in Mission Include, um, what was your experience as a mentor and how do you think it supported your own professional development? Eddie's talked to quite a lot about it, also benefiting the me mentors. And, and how has it helped promote inclusive leadership within your organisation? Um, thanks, Paula, and, 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 and thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Um, in terms of my experience as a mentor, I, I just, I loved it. I, I, I really found it a really um human and engaging sort of thing to do which helped me um it punctuated my work calendar in a way with something that isn't always you know the hamster wheel of work and whilst it gave the mentee space to to, to explore issues and to talk about issues and, and to, to get views and for us to throw ideas around i found that for me it was just an amazingly useful experience that that I would often find myself, you know, walking the dog and kind of reflecting on our conversations that we'd had and, and, and found them quite impactful to help me think about some of my issues at work or, or and, and, and to unpick things. I think in terms of professional development, it, it's the, um, the Mission Include programme, which I took part in was a cross company scheme. So you're placed with different people from different organisations uh, working in different industries. And so that gave me a fresh perspective as well in terms of um, just the way that, that um, different, a different industry approaches issues and approaches development and approaches, you know, the, the layers of staff. And, and it was interesting to me to understand, you know, the, a sector where there's these very sort of distinct um, levels to work through, which is kind of similar to law, but I, I've sort of broken out of that into in-house and kind of found a different route and, and challenging some of, you know, those issues around the stepping up, up the ladder. Um, I, I, you know, and it helped my network. It's, it's, it's it, from a professional development perspective, um, I couldn't be more positive about mentoring. So I spend a lot of time in my organization saying, you know, we should do more and the things that we can do in a different way. And what Mercy just talked about, I think is really powerful in terms of perhaps looking at how to make um, the schemes perhaps quite specific to, to, to individuals and to issues and really getting the power um, of that. So I do think definitely there is, um, it helps sort of inclusive, you know, from an inclusive leadership perspective, just having that curiosity about the human in the other side of this mentoring program, kind of getting to know that person, allowing yourself to be super open minded to different perspectives. And, you know, I, I'm pretty privileged. I sit in a leadership role in my organization. I sit on an exco and being able to reflect back some of that actually, particularly around ways of working and, and a, a different generations perspective on some of those issues was generated some really good discussions so I think um 
yeah, very positive. Brilliant. And it's great to hear that you took that back to Exco and that you explored uh, things that they spoke to you about that they were feeling at a lower level. So. Yeah, I, I think what 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 it did for, for me and perhaps for some of my colleagues is realise that perhaps we'd become quite entrenched in in what ways of working should be or what they should look like and actually that there's a whole different way of thinking about this and we need to put our old views of life of what life was like 15 20 years ago aside and and just listen and understand those different perspectives and, and work with them so yeah that was powerful brilliant that's excellent it's great to hear thank you um Eddie, there's a mix of people in our audience today. Uh, so from different organisations, different backgrounds, different roles within those organisations. Um, some that may not have funds to join a structured mentoring programme or even create one um, or have limited staff resources to manage a scheme. Um, what advice would you give them to successfully implement a mentoring scheme you started out very early on with you know in the ministry of justice very small didn't you so what advice would you give them steal <laughs> steal anything you can you know we we have this saying about stealing with pride there are lots of mentoring uh, mentoring programs around uh, all with slight nuance slightly different different organizations extra etc steal whatever you can and you can take anything that we learn it, it is it's more about, um, it's not so much about the, the cost and the resource to manage it. You know, you can make it as complicated and as specific and as, as really gold standard as you want, but you can also make it very, very simple. Put yeah. two people together, you know, you have two different types of people, use grade, use profession, put them together. It's pretty simple if you want to break it down. You know, you can learn. You, you can learn to maximise benefit. The more specific you say, the more uh, resource you put into it, you'll get more benefit out of it potentially. But you'll get benefit out of it from something very, very simple. So still look around, make it as simple as you can, and try it. Measure it, measure it, measure it. Always measure what you're doing because you know you'll know what 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 things need to change as you go on. But yeah, start small, steal away. Yeah, brilliant. So you've all got carte blanche from somebody who works in the Ministry of Justice <laughs> to st steal the, the catapult programme. And, and the and my name's Paula Kemp, thank you. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> uh, excellent. So, uh, Mercy, quite often the challenge in any mentoring programme can be can be the matching process. And we've talked a bit about it already. Um, either mentees are confused as to why they're matched with someone in particular, very different to themselves or mentors aren't engaging with their mentees. Um, what's your experience been? How have you dealt with that? Um, and what's your experience of being matched with people with the same lived experience or without the same li lived experience? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the top thing is that there needs to be a resonance point. That could be something of a lived experience or that could be something of an expertise. It can be in the same industry or not. I guess my journey with it has been a bit of a mix of both um, or way in more often one and not in the other. So my first ever mentor was a white man, great man, wonderful person, but we both knew the limitations about what that could bring. But what was really great is that it was industry specific. He was also from the UK and it was an international programme. So it was very helpful because he knows what it's like, the industry is like in the UK, specifically London. And that's something we could definitely relate on. But your mentor as well, as, at least with my experience, needs to be open to being okay with the difference points. And he was very understanding of the difference points of being like, I am a white man, I can only take you so far. But what I do have is a network of people. I have amazing women that I can connect you with. And I have amazing women who are not white that I can connect you with. I have people that I know and let's see how we can take it from there. And it's extending that network. On the Amazon program, it has an incredible um, woman mentor. She's amazing. We had different backgrounds. So she is white, I'm black, but it was just having that re resonance as being women in the industry. And that was very helpful because there are different things that we experience. So as women, she was able to tell me like, okay, this is, might be what it looks like for you and this will be different. She was incredible. She had a family, so there was a bit of difference in that. I could almost like project and see what it could look like in the future. 
And then the next program, I had another white woman who was also amazing, but she didn't have a family. So I could see what it's like in a more closer time period. So it's just really interesting where I'm seeing these different resonance points. And then the last program that I'm on at the moment currently um, in October is a black woman. And that's when it's just hit that sweet spot because there is that added layer of intersection where the, there is a difference in experience and lived experience. And she can tell me, listen, this is how it, it could look like. This is what can happen. And for me, I understood now that a lot of maybe some of my fears or concerns are tied to my identity. And she knows that because she's lived through it and she's been through that. So it's been really interesting seeing where the different resonance points are, but both the mentee and mentor need to be open to understanding what those resonance points are, where the similarities are, but equally where the differences are and how we can fill that gap. That's brilliant. Thank you. It's, it's great to hear the different experiences as well, I think, in terms of, um, you know, uh, having been part of mentoring programs or run them before you know I, I've met people in the past like that person's even from job descriptions that person's an accountant and I'm I work in retail I don't see how they can help me and it's like well they could help you on strategy they could help you on things that you know the the, the less creative side of things or, or whatever so it, and it's great to hear about how backgrounds also um, develop that um thank you very much Rachel um what measures did you put into place in your mentoring program to ensure you created a safe space so um Mercy's obviously talked about resonance but making sure that you're very open about where your limitations are what you do and don't know, et cetera. But how can people, how can mentors ensure that there's a safe space for mentees to explore that information? So, so I, I, I think first of all, from a sort of housekeeping sort of perspective, of, I mean, um, our um, relationship was largely virtual. It was it was online meetings, um, and so I think there's a commitment from a housekeeping perspective you know you need to go into those sessions with the right mindset and and you need to carve out the space in your diary you need to find the appropriate environment where you can focus on the individual um and where you're not distracted and you know people aren't coming in to sort of bug you and, and pull you out for, for things um, and and sort of get the right mindset and I, I decided at the outset that I wasn't going to formalize this process that we weren't going to jump straight into right, what do you want out of this and, and what's this about? We took the first probably, certainly the first session, maybe the first one or two sessions where we didn't actually talk about work issues or you know things that we were trying to specifically get out of the programme. We just got to know each other and, and to kind of get a feel for what, what makes this person tick. Um, I, I'm a bit of an open book, so I was kind of happy to share some of my background challenges you know my my situation I've got a family a young family and there's this there's kind of challenges that come with that and we we engaged on a human level a purely human level before we got into um kind of the more challenging work of you know why are we here what 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 are you what are you looking to get out of this what can we what can we do with, with this time that we've set aside to help you progress to help you unlock things um and look, I, I just think it was really important to build that relationship at the outset because it meant that those meetings that we had as the, we then went through the programme were founded on trust and, and a, a, a personal relationship and a human engagement, not a checklist. There were some great materials which um, Mission Include provided to sort of help structure the, the, the meetings. But I, I personally sort of decided that we were going to engage on that human level and that it felt a safe space when we had those conversations and having that discipline to kind of come out of your work day, put that to one side, go make a cup of tea or whatever it is that you need to do, find, find the quiet place where you're gonna really commit and have that conversation. And, and that, that's kind of how I created that, that space for our sessions. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, yeah, and I think that's really key in terms of ensuring that, you know, everybody's very busy people when you put things in the diary and make sure that there's that time and that space created as you know as well as kind of the trust and the physical space but also the time in your diary and and stepping away from your desk um thank you um uh mercy what advice would you give those on a mentoring program who are perhaps a little shy 
or overwhelmed by the seniority of the person they've been matched with. And I know we hear this sometimes. And, and Eddie talked about um, the Catapult programme, you know, that it's the mentee's role to make contact with that senior leader and really kind of push themselves out of their comfort zone. Um, how can somebody with that kind of, uh, you know, who might be slightly nervous or, or, or lack confidence, how can they best get, get the best out of the programme? Yes, yeah, so this is an interesting one because I'm, I'm definitely an expert. Like I am that person that will be emailing first, but I do understand and, and know of people who are in a more of a position that they're more shy. And honestly, I think it's like getting to, if you don't ask, you won't get it. Like, if you really like I if I get overwhelmed with something I try to minimize it to its smallest form and truly with mentorship they are wanting to help like if someone has especially if they've applied to be a mentor they have literally put themselves in a position where they are like I want to help you but I can't help you if you don't ask me the questions so I think it's like really important that you feel okay and that you feel confident. And if you can't get to confidence, that you just understand that the space is there for questions to be asked and whatever that question might be. So I also think it's important that people understand that mentorship and the mentorship relationship is a dialogue and it goes both ways and it's not, it shouldn't be transactional. And that is a case of, okay, the mentor is here to help you, but equally, and I think we mentioned this quite lightly at the top, like the mentors don't know what, the, like, what it's like to be a young person in the industry right now. Like they're not, they had that experience maybe a decade ago or maybe two decades ago. So they want to learn what that looks like now and you can be that knowledge source. So it's a give and take. It's something where it's a dialogue and the communication can very much go both ways and you both have something to give to the relationship to the mentorship relationship so yeah if you don't ask you don't get and just be if, if and I think as well especially in that opening email you can have the time give yourself time don't put pressure on yourself give yourself time to like at least put down three key questions you want to get through in the first conversation and that can be like I just want to understand more about your job it can be as simple as that but give yourself three key questions where you can be like okay this is what I want to achieve in this first conversation. Brilliant, that's great. And I think that's something that anyone who's put in a mentoring programme together needs to sort of sell to the mentors as well as the mentees that it's that you're both at the table then will be open for discussion. So it's a real kind of key part of the mentoring programme. Um, I think we've, we've talked a lot about the opportunities a mentoring brings. So I was just going to ask a few uh, if there was a challenge you faced and if yes, how you overcame it. And then we've got quite a lot of questions in the Q&A. So I'd quite like to then um, switch to them. So, um, Eddie, what was the kind of the a key challenge you faced and how did you overcome it? Good grief. There were lots. I think having having the actual guts to do it because we didn't ask permission we just did it so i thought we'd go down the ask permission seek forgiveness route in terms of we could see there was a there was there was a gap or a need out there and it's just having that gumption to just say right we're going to do it nobody's going to die nobody's going to get injured the risk is low let's just try it and see what happens so i think you know building on that latent stream of activism that we've got in, internally you know people want to do something for the good using that to to make it happen really that's brilliant. the biggest thing i'd say brilliant that's brilliant thank you rachel how about you so um i i think a barrier or a challenge for me was almost giving myself permission to prioritize and make this a true priority um, both, both for my own self, you know, development, but for this other person's development. So, you know, in making that commitment, I was very conscious. I've committed to this. I want it to be meaningful for the person um, who's in this relationship with me. Um, and, it, and it was kind of giving myself the permission to say, I'm going to carve this time out. I'm going to commit to it and I'm going to make this a priority above other business priorities that might be competing. 
at the time. Um, and I'm very glad, actually, that I did. But that, that that I would say that has been my challenge in the past before I actually stepped into a formal programme this time um, was, um, you know, just giving myself the permission and seeing this as a true priority. Hi, everyone. Apologies. I think there must have been some uh, some technical issues with Paula. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just uh, take you through, obviously, thank you all for uh, questions. We've had quite a few questions that have come in. Um, so I'll just go through those questions that have come in with and everyone will get the chance to uh, to speak. So thank you, everybody uh, who's joined today. Um, and just we'll do the Q&A session. So if you do have any other questions, please pop them uh, pop them in the chat. Um, so, Eddie, the first question that's come in, I'll, I'll, I think you might be quite good at answering this. Um, so, is the we've had a question come in? Is the mentoring designed to get uh, persons from lower SEP backgrounds to talk, act, and behave like someone from a higher SEP background, rather than creating an environment and system which reflects who they are? So, it's just seeing if you have any. Uh, response to that one? That's a great question and it's it's one that's been leveled leveled at us quite a bit. Are we trying to change people's background or perception of it? Uh, no, I think it's more about trying to change the mentor's perception was, was my personal aim. I didn't write that down because I get in trouble for that, but it is about it's about building capability and building skills. So, you know, confidence is is a capability issue you know how can we help people to build their confidence we put them in difficult situations that they then thrive in that situation so it was about that so are we trying to change people yes we are are we trying to say that this is a this is an industry norm and we want you to all reach that norm no absolutely not what we're trying to do is to say to the organization we've got everybody we need everybody we need everybody at all levels we want to change the system that allows us to bring all those people in, having those conversations with, between senior leaders and, and more junior staff from potentially different backgrounds is filtering that knowledge, that understanding. You know, Mercy talked about, you know, as a young person, I'm she, what she was giving to the program. That's very much around what we were trying to do to our organization is changing that. And we're looking to, to measure that change in organization, not, not to get everybody to be clones of, white middle class people it's certainly not that at all and we actively go against that brilliant thank you eddie and very relevant around uh, building confidence uh, trying to change in institutional structures as well um mercy as i don't know if you if you had a response to that because you touched on it uh, briefly earlier as well yeah, so I actually want to circle back to the challenge question, because I think that'll be really good to hear that from a mentee's perspective. Um, and I think in terms of, I think, Rachel, you mentioned it, of prioritizing your time and making sure you have time in your schedule for that. On a mentee's perspective, that's also a thing too. Like, definitely making sure you have time and understanding that you need to be in the right headspace to have that conversation. Because if you come up unprepared, that's not going to serve you or your mentor. And as a mentorship, I want, it's, it's very important to understand that it's a relationship. It is a version of a relationship. And if you are not giving into the same relationship as much as your mentor is, that's when it becomes transactional. And it, it doesn't serve anyone. So I think it's just really important to make sure that you're in the headspace for your meetings, that if you have any prep, any homework, if that's what your mentorship relationship is at that point, engage in it and make sure that you really prioritize that. But I just wanted to, um, Edward, I just wanted to circle back to that because I know for mentees, sometimes you're like, oh, just rock up and, you know, have a conversation. They'll tell me what to do. No, no. They want to understand you and you need to make sure that you're there being able to articulate your points in a way that they can now know how to help. Brilliant. Thank you, Mercy. And I think I think we've got Paula back now. Uh, so I'll just double check if Paula is, uh, is there. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> one of one of the things um, I know you were but all talking about was the, was the challenges and how how you overcame them. Are there any particular while we wait for these questions to come through? Are there any particular challenges you've heard of about other mentoring schemes or through other mentors or mentees um, that you were quite surprised to hear and hadn't 
kind of affected you, but but maybe something that might come up. Um, I don't know, Rachel, whether you've heard anything from other mentors. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard where the relationship hasn't been a successful match and it hasn't really got um, off the ground. And I've got to say that I've been I was very lucky in that regard that there was quite a, a, a quick connection and, and, and a click, you know, between um, me and the mentee that I was working with. Um, I have had people who I'm aware of who've been on other schemes and that relationship hasn't really got off the ground and, and the relationship therefore has never really made the best of the programme and it's it's put those individuals off perhaps doing it again. And so I think I, th I think sometimes the matching maybe um, can be a challenge. Yeah, I think that's the case. And and I think it's always important to encourage if you're running a programme or if you're part of a programme and the matching's not working, is to feed that back to the match, back to the uh, people that are organising it, because they rather than just drop out, they could match you with other people. I think, Eddie, is that what you do if people come back to you if the, the mentoring hasn't taken off for them? Uh, only your mentees, Paula. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think the more sophisticated you your program becomes the less that becomes an issue because you, you you can you can do those you can check beforehand you know you can say here's some mentors do you want to have a chat with them beforehand so you, you almost do a a speed date to to eliminate that with our program we don't do that we, we literally just take two people based on their profession and we put them together and i think that the, the what we learn the most is we learn from where it doesn't work and it's a very small minority that don't work but that's where we learn the most. So there's a risk with doing it that it's a cheaper way. It's a less resource intensive. Be aware that you will get some dropouts, but essentially, you know, if people are in it for the right reasons, mercy came with the point, you know, what is the outcome? What are you trying to do? If you're clear on that, everybody signs up being knowing that that's the, that's the outcome. They'll make it work more or less. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and Mercy, were you surprised at any mentees that you had who had any particular struggles that, that surprised you at all? Um, do you know what? I feel like I want to bring up, like, Gen Z's a really resilient, like, generation. And if you know what I'm referencing, you know. But I think it's really interesting because from my understanding and my, like, the mentees that I've been in programmes with, even if the matchup doesn't seem like it should work, there is, it's not always about expertise, especially the last two years that we've like lived through and everything that's come with it. A lot of it's emotional support. And that is a lot of things that are needed. And Rachel, I know you mentioned that you, you like to bring the emotional side into it and just bring in that human experience and that human level. At the end of the day, sometimes I just need to know how to schedule my day. That's what I need to learn. Like, I'm not here to learn hardcore skills all the time. Sometimes I need to understand I'm actually kind of nervous to start engaging with, you know, a new team member that's come in. How do I do that? Dynamics, management dynamics, all these type of things. It's not necessarily hard skills. And I think with the mentees that I know who may have been like, why am I matched up with someone in digital when I'm in journalism? What, what is that all about? But they know skills in terms of more softer skills of management of being able to schedule to-do lists anything like that or just dynamics in the office especially going into in-person more for people are gen z maybe you've never been in an office before and now that you know we've somehow come out of the other end of covid it's now a thing where it's like oh i'm understanding office etiquette office dynamics like this person who's done it before will be able to guide me through that and that's the that's the experience I'm literally having right now and it's just very helpful having emotional support and sometimes I'm like to my mentor I'm like you might as well be my therapist at this point <laughs> <laughs> it's just that layer of like they've been through it they know that emotional side and any professional has probably been there before on the emotional side yeah, brilliant. That's great. Thank you, Mercy. Um, a question we've had in the Q&A is how do you ensure people are putting themselves forward to be mentees? Um, I have struggled to get proactive involvement, engagement with social mobility initiatives in the past. I wonder whether part of the problem is having the foresight and awareness of how useful networking and mentoring can be. Again, I'm going to ask you that question, Eddie, and then I'm also going to change that question is how do you ensure people to put themselves forward to mentors as well because I think that is often also a challenge 
So Eddie, how, how have you <clears throat> kind of made sure that people put themselves forward? It's really difficult because, you know, we've got a massive organisation, so you just put the offer and those that are interested will apply. So it, we've never had to uh, twist people's arms to join as mentees or mentors, to be fair. I think it goes back to that clarity about what are you trying to do? We're not trying to change you as a person in terms of, you know, change things about you. It's about building those skills. And Mercy alluded to that a lot. It's about it's about soft behaviors, soft strengths, soft skills, all that kind of stuff that you can gain knowledge about and understanding about. And, you know, the more self-aware you become, the better you can become as a person and all that kind of stuff. I think making sure those that there's that clarity about what it's trying to do, that encourages people to apply. But we don't strong arm people, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> I, I mean, I think also an, another thing that, that people can do is, is reach out to line managers. So they would have people within their teams that they think they might not be confident to put themselves forward. But if I talk to them about would this be of interest to you, would you be keen to, this is what you could get out of it. I think there's an opportunity to, to reach people through their line management. Um, so, um, Rachel, I know you were very willing to sign up to the Mission Include when it came through as an option, um, but how, how do people encourage mentors to get involved? So, so I, I think that perhaps organisations can help by, you know, top down demonstrating that this is important, this is, this is valuable for our entire organisation, mentees mentors this helps this helps you understand the people are in this organization outside this organization helps you get to grips with with what talent talent might look different how it used to look you know 20 years ago open your mind kind of be deeply curious about it but i do think it requires that top down so it came across my desk i saw it and thought you know i've been meaning to do this in a more formal way forever i'm i'm going to go for this, I'm going to apply. Um, but I think it could have higher profile. And I think profile from, from the very top of the tree that says, we think this is really important and this helps us with, uh, uh, as an organisation to be a better and more diverse and inclusive and respectful environment. So go for it, guys. Um, okay. that, so I think there is something around just really positive um, messaging around how important these initiatives are. Brilliant. That's great. And and you talked about higher profile. I know, Mercy, you've done some uh, sessions where you're talking to future mentees um, and, and you're obviously sharing your experience is here. So I guess part of that storytelling you feel was really important to get the message out that these mentoring programmes exist and what they can do for you. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, like I think it goes back to kind of like things that Eddie and, and I and Rachel, honestly, that we've all said, where it's like, if we all know why we're here, like it just clarity, clarity, clarity is really, really great because that then helps you be like, you're all at least in the same book. You might not be on the same page yet, but you're like, you have picked up the same book and we can start understanding what page we're on so that we can start turning those pages together. So I guess with mentees for example the program I'm on right now is for black creators and that is a range of different things in the creative industry but what we know is that there are some barriers that are up that we're trying to progress through together and that is and then with the mentee cohort and I think what's really important about programs and creative mentor network is this absolutely fantastically is that the mentees create a relationship as well that we keep each other going as well, that we have the WhatsApp group chats and that we communicate. I met up with a um, fellow mentee for my programme on Monday and we've not seen each other in months. And it was just amazing. We were like, oh, like, how are you getting on? And she's out here directing films. Like, she's doing great things. And I'm telling her I'm in a new job. And, like, keeping that relationship is really important. But there needs to be cues to make that happen. So I think it's really great when the mentorship programme, as much as mentees choose to use them or not, have those spaces like okay we have a whatsapp group 
okay, remember you did this program? Here's what people are doing now. I think there's an amazing exhibition on for Black History Month as well for people that have been on Creative Mentor Network programs before. And you can all come together and be like, wow, like you've created that. I've seen you on this program, but I'm from that program. And it's just amazing when there is a push and there is kind of a nudge for mentees. Like you can also have each other's backs. Like keep your mentorship relationship with your mentor great. But what about this cohort that you've got going on? Like you have all experienced something that only this cohort has experienced. So make sure that you have that conversation with each other and support each other as well. Yeah, and I think that's something that we we've not really alluded to. I think you mentioned before about networks, but we've not alluded to is that that the the it's beyond just a relationship with your mentee and your mentor. You you are likely to meet other people through this. And, and how is it going to benefit both of your professional and personal development by engaging in those other relationships? So that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, we're coming close to the end. So um, a final question from me, really, before we close. Um, based on your experience, what would be your one top tip that uh, anyone thinking of either starting a mentoring scheme or taking part in one? So kind of People often talk about an in inclusion space. What's the silver bullet? There is none, as we know. It's a, it's something that just needs to continue. Um, but, but what would be one top tip? Um, so I'm going to start with you, Rachel. Uh, no, my top tip is very simple. If you're going to do it, commit. Put 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 your all into it, and and be really present, and and make it meaningful. Brilliant. Great. Thank you, Eddie. Okay. So from a from a, a management perspective, so managing a program, setting it up, I think my one top tip is be clear about what it's trying to deliver. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Mercy? Yeah, from a mentee's perspective, I definitely say just don't underestimate yourself. Don't underestimate the knowledge that you bring to the relationship. Your mentor is there to learn just as much as you are there to learn from them. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. And I think from, from my, my top tip, having been involved in previous mentoring programs, I'm ru running them as well, is, is encourage your mentor cohort, your mentee cohort to pay it forward. So once they've been on a few programs, mentee programs, how are they then going to become a mentor? Uh, because you, that is often the challenge. Uh, you know, one of the questions was, how do you find mentees? Quite often, it's difficult to find mentors. Um, so how can you encourage those that have been part of the program to continue forward? Um, so that's brilliant. Thank you very much um, to all of our panelists. So thank you, Mercy. Thank you, Eddie. And thank you, Rachel. Um, we are going to have another couple of events coming up in November. So the first one is uh, with Anne Frank from the Chartered Management Institute. Um, she's going to be talking about the building blocks of social mobility. So please do visit our events listings and we'll share the details with you after the event as well. Um, that's early November. Um, and then at the end of November, we're going to explore T levels um, and what are they? How do they work for social mobility? Uh, how can you, as an employer, access them? So please do look out for those events. Um, there'll be a recap following uh, of this session. So please, if you found it useful, please do share it with other colleagues. But just remains for me to say apologies for my connection. Um, but thank you to Edward for standing in. And again, thanks to our speakers today, Eddie Fletcher of Ministry of Justice, Mercy Abel of the Audacity of We podcast and Rachel Dalby from Anglo-American. Thank you very much.